pharmaceutical advertising, just as a short background, it's expanding. You can now do it online. You can see it in magazines. You can see it on TV. What it does is change the way we access pharmaceuticals. Um, we now go to doctors. We tell them what drug we want. They give us the drug. What do you think about that? Do you think that we should be expanding pharmaceutical advertising so that the patient has all the information and can make an educated call? Or should we go to our experts, the doctor, whoever, uh, get them to diagnose us and then get the medication? It's sort of, there's a, there's a duality to it now and it's a, it's a changing landscape. Yeah, that dynamic. I just wanted to know what your, what your take on it is. That dynamic is, is, is sort of old and doesn't really apply anymore. When in the 90s and early 2000s when pharma was booming, and when I say pharma, I mean general small molecule pharma was booming, um, the ads made a difference. Today, almost all of major medicine is not general medicine. The top selling drugs are drugs people have never heard of, like Rituxin and Opdivo and Zavaldi, where there are no ads for these medicines. And in fact, the reason there are no ads for these medicines is because there's no choice <laughs> for these medicines. If you get hepatitis C, you're going to take Zavaldi and you're, you're in no position to tell your doctor you want Zavaldi any more than you want the other hep C drug because you have no idea um, uh, of the differences. And it's not like they're going to be any different. Oh, I want this chemotherapy instead of that chemotherapy. How silly is that? Because I saw an ad. You know, you might say you want this, um, you know, you want this pain drug because you saw an ad, but those drugs are not being made anymore, really. Um, the major sellers are these esoteric drugs that are not um, mass marketed. Of course, we still see one or two of them from time to time, but the big mass marketed drugs are not selling well. The last two big, um, the last two drugs, um, two obesity drugs, have failed miserably to sell despite um, direct to consumer advertising. Um, and the reason is, I think that um, there's, they're just, it's just sort of a business model that's gone now. Um, so um, they're not selling at all, and um, those companies are going bankrupt because they bet that these mass marketed drugs would would do well. But the um, at the end of the day, they're they're not being reimbursed by insurance, and um, you know, it's, it's the cancer drugs and the, the rare disease drugs that are really doing well. And those aren't drugs that are ever really advertised. So There's only a few countries where it's legal to do direct-to-consumer advertising now. Yeah. Um, I don't think it makes a difference, to be honest. I think that um, doctors tend to kind of scoff at patients that you know, want drugs. And the certain drugs that they do want, the Cialis and Viagra's of the world, those are, in essence, consumer products to begin with. Um, they're not really, um, they're, they're a little closer to consumer products than medicine, I would say. So, you know, there are very few advertisements for cancer medicines, you know. You have lung cancer, you're not telling your doctor what to do. Screlly, what's going on? Chill. All right, Screlly, so listen, I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, how did you get your first investors? Uh, well, I worked in the hedge fund. Hey, my question isn't how you sealed the deal, my question is how you went to the mission. Well, I worked in hedge funds, and you work in an industry, um, you uh, meet people, you network, and, you know, when I started a hedge fund, those investors, and hedge funds, and stuff like that, and when I started drug companies, it's much of the same. I had done work in investing in pharmaceutical companies, so there were drug investors who knew all about me. It made sense. That makes a lot of sense, but Mr. Show, the question I have for you is that, you know, when you meet, you know, because I work in finance, so when you meet somebody, you know, working as, I guess, like an account manager at a hedge fund, the question is, what kind of value proposition can somebody, you know, not, not for nothing that low in the company offer some of these big-time investors for them to, you know, really be able to have confidence in a pharmaceutical, you know, section? Uh, well, if you sound like you know what you're talking about, you can raise a lot of money. I raised hundreds. <laughs> Uh, in general, if the person who is pitching sounds like they know what they're talking about, then they can raise some money. Okay. Well, first of all, like, first of all, let me tell you something. I own your website. All right, that's number one. I own smellyscholar.com. All right, that's number one. Number two, I also sent you an email uh, earlier this morning. I want you to take a look at it from Andrew Sandow. Uh, I'm very busy, and I don't know I what... Know. What website you're talking about, but 
I don't have any website like that. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, first, you know, so I'll be real quick. You know, um, you know, we've been in business for about a year now. We're the Uber of attorneys, and we're going to be launching this April to this country and basically good luck. Good luck. We can, <clears throat> what? Good luck. Good luck. I know. Well, we're, you know, we don't need luck. I'm not. I'm not calling you for luck. I'm calling, you know, just to give you an idea what we're doing. Give us something that you'd be interested in. Nope. You know, once you do, uh, I can guarantee you because if you're a man that nope. looks at numbers, if you're a man that looks at numbers, you'd be able to understand. I mean, if you want to. If you want to just say no, because you can't say no, I mean, that's, that's not something that's going to affect me directly. Okay, cool. Me directly. Nope. So, Scarlett, let me ask you something. You're, 30, you're 32 years old, all right? You run your mouth all day long on the internet, all right, or, or 50% of the day, and if somebody calls you with an honest, serious question, you're like, I mean, what's that show all about? Uh, just not interested in talking to you. I just get a lot of phone calls. I stick to my own group of people, my own network, my own businesses. I don't really need to talk to you. And that works both ways, you know, obviously. I, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't call you. I didn't bother you. No, I know that. I know that. I know that. But obviously, you have enough time to do two random phone calls. Well, I'm, I'm having fun. Uh, business and fun are different. Right. So we're both having fun, that's really. I mean, look, Scully, I'm 10 years your junior, but I'm 10 times your weight. Okay, I don't mean physically. Uh, really? Right. So, yeah, yeah, Scully, it's very simple. It's very simple. If you're going to know why you're not, you know, not interested. I'm just not. I'm just not interested. I do these phone calls not for business reasons. I do them for entertainment reasons. Well, yeah, it's, it's an entertainment for you to, you know, really, you know, be able to share, you know, something like you that went from really nothing, you know, to, to being able to pitch somebody and tell them that you've got the secret form of the pharmaceutical industry. It's not Shark Tank, you know. I I do these calls. No, it's not Shark Tank. All right, just let me, just let me, just let me, please let me, please stop. You're talking. You talk too much. You gotta let me. You gotta let me get in a word here. I do these uh, live streams because uh, I like to entertain people. I like to entertain myself. Uh, they're not meant to be serious. They're meant to be humorous. Um, I am a very serious business person, but my businesses are kind of self-contained. I don't look for new opportunities outside of my core competency, which is pharmaceuticals. Uh, that's a totally different subject. Um, but... Yeah, let me, let me, my, let me, let me, don't tell, don't, don't pretend to tell me what my business is. My business, I, please let me finish. Please let me finish. You keep interrupting me and it's, it's very frustrating. Um, that part, part of, part of the way you should improve your pitch is to be a little less forceful. Um, I'm a, yeah, please let me, please let me finish. I'm a, I'm a pharmaceutical investor. That is where the bulk of my assets are. 99% of my assets, um, I'm going to always be a pharmaceutical investor. It's what I've known well. I've done that my whole life. It would be crazy to give up my investments in pharmaceutical to do something different. Am I involved in, in a tech startup? In a, in a very, you know, am I working on a tech startup? Yeah, sure. But I have room and time for one and one alone. And I'm not interested in any other pitches. So just please leave me alone. Well, sure. I mean, you know, nobody's please, that, so please. Like, you are my. I don't want to talk to you. I'll please. Help you yeah, I picked up the phone because I'm trying to entertain people and I'm trying to have fun, and this isn't fun. Well, then, what do you want to talk about? I don't want to talk to you. Please just leave me alone. Scully, what, what am I holding your hand? Like, what's your phone on fire? You can't you? You're annoying me. You're, you're very abrasive. You're an abrasive individual. You're an abrasive and obnoxious individual. I don't want to have any. No, 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 I don't want to have any further communi- I don't want to have any communication. I don't want to have any communication with you. I'm. I'm. You're. You're very abrasive. You're very frustrating. You're annoying, and I just don't like you. No, I mean, Screlly, Screlly, look. The only reason. Don't call me Screlly. You don't know me. All right. Well, we're going to call you. I'm trying to address you in a respectful manner. So what do you say? Just, I'm just, you don't have to. I think you're. How can you just ask somebody to speak to you? You know, in a, in a, in a way I'm that telling that you that I don't, don't want to have any. Do you, do you, do you I don't want to have any communication, want want any communication with you. I don't want to have any communication with you whatsoever. I want I want you to end this phone call and cease any communication with me going forward. You got your fingers right there, right? Do something about it. Uh, I am just telling you that I did not like this phone call. I appreciate I would appreciate it if you never call me again. Um, I'm going to say this to you. I'm going to end it like this. I'm going to end it like this. Game real, real shit. Real shit. It wasn't intended. You want to come at you? Yeah. 
All right. Listen, thanks for your right. call. Please leave me alone. Please don't call me again. There we go. That took a while. Yeah. Was that Lex? No, no, it wasn't Lex. Check. Uh, legalization of old drugs. Of what? Of what? Legalization? I, I don't know that old... I, you're not making any sense. You're... you're old drugs? What, what, do, what do you mean legalization of old drugs? They're no more or less... You know, they're no more... No, I don't, because old drugs are no more or no less legal than new drugs. Maybe you could clarify that, because a lifetime in pharmaceuticals leads me to have no idea what you're saying. It's just weed. It's just weed, dude. You're saying... Compared to the shit I've seen you do, this is weed. I... You're saying legalization of old drugs. No, all the drugs. You know you said... Oh, all! All! A-L-L! I told you your yeah. the, your clarity is, is horrific. Your your oh, phone your phone you. is poor and your enunciation is worse. I'm calling, I'm calling you through Skype. Now you understand why I couldn't hear you. With respect to to legalizing drugs, look, man, I it's a libertarian perspective, but the reality is that people need to be um, protected from themselves. In essence, um, you know, people can't be their own physicians. Uh, there's a reason that you have to go to medical school. Um, if if you were to write your own prescriptions, in essence, um, you would become either you would waste healthcare utilization um, or you would um, hurt yourself. <laughs> so I think you should, you know, it, it's a good thing that we have doctors. Well, just, I'm sorry. Please uh, go ahead. Isn't it just like Darwinism, natural selection? <laughs> you know, I, I think that, you know, children um, and uh, the elderly and the vulnerable should not be victims of those forces necessarily if we can have a system like a physician uh, system that... It's uh, it certainly is Darwinism. I'm not disputing that. It's yeah, just well, a. That, 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 that is the most natural thing in the world. And there's no doubt, but you have to understand that the timescale of Darwinism is 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 long, and that human nature and the temporal crunch of 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 where we're at, you know, we're we're, we're sort of a blink of an eye when it comes to a grand force like evolution. So, you know, even though even though it's quote unquote Darwinism, I mean, you don't see people. We don't execute people who are, are, are um, you know, have uh, uh, slight uh, disabilities and infirmities, even though that, that would technically be a Darwinistically, I guess, appropriate thing to do or something. I, I, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a great argument uh, in my eyes. No, but I have another one. Okay. Uh, what gives you the right, well, and, uh, and you as the, sure. anyone who says, uh, who is against legalization, what gives them the right to choose? I actually or debated this. With- I, I I actually totally uh, some part of me actually agrees on this. I was filing a so-called IND initial new drug application for medicine um, that I did uh, seven days of toxicology, and the FDA guy told me he wouldn't let dying kids take the drug because I didn't do twenty-eight days of toxicology, and I asked him to justify his rationale for why the arbitrary choice of the number of days of toxicology mattered. And he refused to do so. He just said, I'm, I'm the FDA guy and it's 28 days and that's that. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to have to do the 28 days, but you know, there's a bunch of kids dying of this disease that kind of want to take this drug. And you know, you're, you're just being a bureaucrat. And you know, um, this is a guy that a lot of people don't like. His name is Dr. Farkas at FDA, very influential guy. And, um, practically he, um, you know, he sort of set back this program by six months just because, the subtext of this is that I didn't ask him first how many days um, he wanted. So it was like, uh, you're supposed to, you know, it, it, seven and 28 is equivalent. It really doesn't make a difference. But in his mind, the disrespect of not asking him first was was enough to set the program back. So I asked senators to that exact question. What, gave, what gives FDA the right to tell a dying person that they cannot try to save their own life? Um, to me, that's remarkable. I I I I I, yeah. I I understand that there should be a doctor to tell you how to use a I don't know a drug for rheumatoid arthritis so you don't hurt yourself or <laughs> or or worse that a predatory. I, I let me finish. A predatory drug company doesn't say, "Hey, man, you have rheumatoid arthritis. You really need this medicine," and you start prescribing because because you get scared. And that, that's really what, the, what why we have this system. It's 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 less to protect you from the. Ills of medicine. I think people are smart enough to understand. A lot of people, I will say, are smart enough to understand how to use the medicine. It doesn't mean that um, 
everyone is, right? I, I would challenge you to do your own IV. It would be extremely difficult um, for you to do that. Um, perhaps, perhaps you could do it. I would challenge, I would say that 99% of Americans could not do their own intravenous infusions regularly. Um, and I think that's reasonable. You, you are an outlier. Good for you. But, um, you know, physicians, you know, are, are a necessary, reasonable thing. But if, if the patient's dying, I do think that they, there's a reasonable, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I think they're a disaster for society. I think the society breaks. I mean, there's a reason that people don't like illicit narcotics in their neighborhoods. It, it, it rips the fabric of society, whether, again, marijuana is, is obviously up for debate and it's a very different story. But if you're talking about heroin, <laughs> you can see it's heroin and fentanyl. I mean, it's, it's a disaster in the United States. There's an enormous amount of people dying and addicted and it's, it ruins our communities. Uh, the, the trafficking of drugs that, come with uh, all the things that come with trafficking of drugs, the illegal manufacturer, the importation, the, the drugs, the weapons, the money, the, all those things, the crime that, that revolves around it is, it's just, it's, it's not uh, favorable. Anyway, I gotta keep going. Hello? The question is, if I get convicted, do you think you'll ever be able to handle anyone else's money? I don't wanna handle anyone else's money. I never wanna do that. Um, I did that briefly. Can't say I liked it. You know, I, uh, I'm focused on creating drugs, not, you, you know, trading and investing. That's not, you know, I yeah. think the real value is created by, the real money is made by creating stuff, not by trading pieces of paper. Yeah. You know, actually creating real things that people like and use and want. Yeah. That's where I think success if comes you from. You created a drug that that's people want and you yeah. just like up prices. Well, I have a new drug. I just got some results this morning, actually, that we made a, a new drug that's substantially better than Daraprim already. So, in just six months. Here's just a man. Oh, so you're still allowed to do the, the same thing? Even yeah. Though, uh, What's up? They, 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 they can't, they can't they stop that man from running through. their business. Like, the six months, what do you go through to, like, make a drug? Hell and back. <laughs> Pull them back. Yeah. It's a lot of, it's a lot of trial and error. A lot of trial and error. Yeah, it should have no side effects if we did our job right, but you never know until you try it. And we'll be trying it hopefully at the end of the, you know, December ish. It's trial and error. The way, trying, what's it for exactly? It's for an infection called toxoplasmosis. Um, everyone has it. It's funny. 25% of people have it. So all people. Yeah, see, look, Martin, I, I went to school for computer. I went to school for computer information systems, and my girlfriend, Andrea, she's a nursing student, so. Cool. Yeah, Toxo is, uh. We're going to do all right. Yeah, Toxo is, a lot of people have it. If you've ever eaten raw meat, you probably have it. Um, so, a lot of people eat raw meat. If Sorry. Um, so mo for almost everyone, it does nothing happens because your immune system can keep it. It, okay. it, it was, was for AIDS, AIDS though, correct? Well, so like I said, you twenty five percent of people have it, so probably one of us has it. And but we all have normal immune systems, so the immune system can control yeah. the infection and keep it in a dormant state, similar to herpes and HIV and some other illnesses like that. And um, not exactly the same, but somewhat similar. CMV is another one, JC virus. This is, a, this is a common idea that we have infections, active infections, but they're dormant in a, in a sense. So yeah. it's not funny, it's just sort of interesting. Anyway, um, cats aren't as much of a vector for toxoplasmosis as people think, but that's another story. Um, yeah. Raw meat, like just tuna tartare, like, you know, Beef tartare. I mean, you know, like if I like, cause no. when I eat Martin, meat, wait, hold on, Andrea, hold on, Martin. Sorry. When I just, when I just took her out to dinner, she didn't know what the steak tartare was. <laughs> so the last thing is that, so if you have a passive infection, it can turn into an active infection if you're immunosuppressed. Who's immunosuppressed? Obviously, AIDS patients, cancer patients, yeah. very old people get immunosuppressed yeah. for no reason. 
So if you're immunosuppressed, the toxoplasmosis infection goes active and then it kills you. So it's a very terrible infection if you don't have a good immune system. Uh, it's a very manageable yeah. infection if you do. Our drug kills the toxoplasmosis for people who are immunosuppressed. The problem is that our drug also kills the patient. Um, and it, if you take it for long periods of time or at high doses, so there needs to be a drug that's um, significantly safer and only kills the toxoplasmosis enzyme. I think we've created, in fact, we've created dozens of them, as Cypher is saying, it's trial and error. We have to see which ones work best in mice and monkeys, and then hopefully later yeah. in the year we'll, uh, we'll be what, testing what, it what in humans. You, what do you usually use, Martin? Do you usually use mice? You start with mice and rats, but you, you have to go to and a higher... You go to a monkey. You have to go to higher species, dogs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to do something that's, that's similar to a human. Beagles and then rhesus macaques, which are... Now, do you do that process, or does someone else work with the animals? There's a, there's a whole... No, he, he's outsour- got a whole squad. Outsourced system for that. There's companies that specialize only in that. CROs. So you just write, you just write the compounds? Uh, it's, well, my chemist, Steve, and I um, have spent a lot of time creating these drugs. We're like the dynamic duo. Um, I think, I mean, I used to have a really great set of chemists. Steve and I are the most prolific uh, team you'll ever imagine. Steve is only 27, 26, 27. You're right. So I'm 33. Yeah, I'm 33. He's 27. We're inventing like a drug every three months. It's crazy. Uh, And not just like, I mean, for toxoplasmosis, we have 200 different compounds. So you, you have to test different compounds for one yeah. disease state, but I come up with the biology and pharmacology, which is what I'm an expert in. Steve's. Wait, repeat those words. I come up with the biology and pharmacology, and I have a little bit of insight in chemistry, tiny, tiny bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got the opposite. He's got a huge amount of knowledge in chemistry. He's got a little bit of insight in pharmacology and drug yeah. development. So we're a great yeah. team. And he's also a workaholic. He's a, he's an amazing guy. He went to Columbia. He has a PhD in medicinal chemistry from Columbia, but he's uh yeah. He's also from the streets, so he uh, played basketball. He's uh, got a street now. He's half black, half um, European, and he doesn't look like a chemist. Most chemists are kind of, they look a certain way. Yeah, um, power shirt. Steve's got crazy tattoos everywhere. He's got a big earring. <laughs> he's, he's the best. Yeah, I look more like a chemist than Steve does. What's his um, name? Steve Thomas. Yeah. Doctor, well, Remember Dr. that um, Jim that was at uh, our school? I actually am a bio- biologist and pharmacologist. I've invented about eight different eight different drugs. Uh, I, don't, I don't put myself around smart people. Smart, smart people put themselves around me. 